Welcome to Disruptors. This is a analysis debrief of our very moving and emotional interview with Craig Harrison, who has the world record for many years for the longest snipe kill. And we've been getting a lot more requests to do these debrief analyses. This is Harry Kumar, who's the head producer and manager of the entire channel. Two important things before we get into this. Number one, if you haven't watched the full interview with Craig Harrison, you need to watch that first. So the link is in the description, the comments. Number two is trigger warning. Um, there's a lot of very emotional, at times probably quite disturbing content. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that this is intense, so trigger warning. So this was a very left field interview and it was very unexpected from both of us going into this. Why did you take on this interview in the first place? So Craig Harrison was on Lad Bible. And I don't usually look at other channels to seek out guests. We like to be original and disruptive. But it really moved me, the interview that I saw. And I thought we've done nothing like this before on Disruptors. So in a way, this interview is disrupting disruptors. And what did you learn? I learned that chronic PTSD is a thing, not just PTSD. I didn't know what chronic PTSD was before interviewing Craig. You don't need to be a doctor sitting opposite Craig, seeing how emotional he was and how he would go from hurt and upset to anger. Mm got in my face at times and he apologised for it, which I didn't think he needed to do, but you don't need to be a doctor to see that he has had such a traumatic experience that <laughs> chronic PTSD is a thing. I was shocked at his recollection of how little the military did for him. Now, it might be different now, and I wasn't in the military, but he didn't think they did anything like enough for him and others. They, they don't even pay for his therapy sessions that he has. And I, he definitely felt that he really needs those therapy sessions. It's really hard for Craig and maybe others like him who've been through war to acclimatise into civilian life, civvy life. Um, I learned that if it wasn't for his dog, he would have committed suicide. I learned how hard it is for his wife. Yeah. And how it's amazing what she's done to stick by him. I also learned through Craig that sometimes medication can be a good thing because my general view is that most of the populace are medicated too early or self-medicate too early or that's the easy thing to go and give medication out. And I personally think that Big Pharma has an ulterior motive to do that. That's how they make profit. Um, and so I've started to think maybe that I've seen people who are on antidepressants who I think they could have done things before. I can't say for sure they shouldn't be on antidepressants, but what I can see is I've completely seen their personality change on them. So they are not them anymore. And was enough really done before to try and manage your own emotions? And I still believe that for most of the populace. But what Craig said was, for people with chronic PTSD like me, medication is good mm. because basically it stops them killing themselves. So when you scripted this in your head before you did this interview, how did you imagine it going and what was the, how was it different from the reality of the interview and how it went? So the process, so everyone knows of interviewing someone is, we do a lot of research and then we often cancel out a lot of that research. Because if you go on Wikipedia or you go on their website or you listen to a couple of other interviews, all you're doing is churning out the same verbiage. 
So part of our research is anti-research to discount what everyone else has talked about. And so when we'd done our anti-research, Harry, Tom, Melissa, the team, all provide our own questions. And then I go through them and I collate them. And a bit like I imagine Radiohead, I know that Radiohead have argued over the order of their songs. And I really consider for a long time and carefully the order of the questions. Within three questions, I knew that half of the rest of the questions I couldn't ask because they would be too insensitive mm. or they've already been addressed in the interview. So sometimes, like with Chris Eubank, I mean, the, after the first question, the whole <laughs> script was gone. And with Craig, it was a different kind of thing. Because with Chris, he was like a slippery eel on Vaseline. I was clearly not going to be able to follow my guideline. But with Craig, some of the questions would just have come across insensitive. Definitely, yeah. And so we dropped those. Well, when I say we dropped those, in the moment I just chose to not ask them or reword them. And in those instances, you have to sort of take the lead of the guest, but without letting the guest own the episode. So Chris tried to own my episode, Chris Eubank, and I wasn't going to let him own it because I've got my outcome. But with Craig, I much more went with him and what he wanted to express because I felt that was the right thing to do. Craig, how does it feel to kill a man? Wow. Um, it's unnatural to kill, some, to kill a human, you know, and I think if you enjoy it, you, there's something wrong with you. But um, when I got my first kill, um, I thought I did something wrong. But yeah, it's a, it's a whole world, empty feeling inside. You feel, feel quite sick. It's not a celebrational feeling at all. But I hit him. Um, I, I missed on my first shot. I hit the bike. The bike fell over. And then I hit the guy on my second shot. Um, I, I hit him. Oh, so I hit him up here. Um, I approached the guy. Um, he was taking his last breaths. Uh, the motorbike throttle was stuck in the sand. It was revving like fuck. He had an AK-47 strapped to it. Um, he had a map on him, uh, in his hand, and also he had a, um, a radio. Yeah, he, he passed away. He passed away. In front of your in, eyes? In front of my eyes, yeah. Um, because I had to approach that body to make sure that I did kill him, you know, and he was beyond saving, beyond saving, because where, where I'd hit him, he wouldn't have survived anyway. Um, but yeah, and that was my first kill, you know, and I said sorry. Did you? Yeah. To him? Yeah. Wow. I know he's the enemy. Um, is it the enemy? I'm not sure, the insurgents or whatever, but yeah, I put my hand on him and I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. When I heard the story of Craig's first kill, I kind of actually almost melted inside because I've had some ex-military men on disruptors, people like David Goggins, and they have this hard exterior and often you can't get in. And I try. But with Craig, he just opened up very early and there was no armour. Very vulnerable. No armour. So for him to have killed an enemy that probably would have killed his crew and to see him dying with a bullet in his neck and to apologise to him and say sorry really made me understand there was a very conflicted man there where he's doing a valiant job for his country but he's struggling with killing other human beings and the implications of that. Let's talk about your discharge mm -hmm. because were you in about 20 years service? 23 years. Wow, it's a long time. I didn't know I had something wrong with me. I felt something was wrong but I didn't know what it was. My wife noticed first. My wife noticed first there was something wrong with me, you know, because my Afghan tour, my last tour was a fucking... Yeah, it was, um, that was my worst tour. My worst tour. Got fucking smashed. Fucking smashed. G 
she cuddles me and she goes, Every, everything will be all right, everything will be all right. And I thought, I'm gone, I'm, I'm gone, I'm, I'm ill, I'm ill. That's what the doctor said, you're ill. And in fact, I wasn't allowed back in camp. Um, I just, they call it gardening leave, where they just send you home. And I was just festered at home. For a year, I festered at home while they arranged my um, medical discharge. And then I got discharged. So 23 years I did, and it took me half an hour to get kicked out. Half a fucking hour. Not even a thank you, not even a well done, nothing. You would have thought his senior officers would have shown him some gratitude. You would have thought that the military might give him more support, pay for his therapy, mm. maybe, yeah, from how he said it, I don't know if betrayed is the right word, because it, it can't be that easy running the military. And I, I think mental health issues, PTSD, C, PTSD, I don't really think we fully understand it yet. How can we? We don't fully understand the mind. How can we fully understand the broken parts of the mind? So it would be unfair of me to say, yes, the military betrayed Craig. I wasn't there and I don't know how hard it is to deal with. But Craig was very emotional and really felt that the military betrayed him. And so wh why would I not believe him? He also hates the term man up. What do you think about that? I think if someone is crying over not getting a Wi-Fi connection, telling them to man up's fine. If someone spent 20 years in the military and their emotions are just dismissed by telling them to man up, that's very not fine. So I think, I think, not I know, but I think that the context from him hating the phrases like man up is that so many people in the military were so chronically in PTSD and emotionally scarred, yet they just had to crack on with it and they, were, they didn't feel they were able to open up about it. Was the question you asked him about Betsy, his uh, dog that passed away, was that a mistake? By the way, is, is your dog Betsy still with you? She passed away June, a couple of months ago. Biggest impact in my life, that little dog. This little dog. Biggest impact in my life. I try not think about her because it upsets me. She, she saved my life. I was going to shoot myself in America. And she saved my life. And me and her were fucking tight as you like. And she passed away. I can't replace her. I can't replace her, you know? I don't know how a question can be a mistake because a question is a question. How can it be a mistake? The answer is what the answer is. It really affected him though, he was weeping after that. Yeah, but it wasn't because of the question, it was because his dog saved his life and his dog had recently passed away. So it depends how you define, was it a mistake? If my goal was to not have any emotions of Craig's show, it was a mistake. If my goal was to show how human and raw and real and honest Craig is, it was probably the best question. So it depends how you define it. He didn't get upset. He didn't tell me I shouldn't have asked that question. If I'd have asked a question and he got really angry and thought that that question was disrespectful, then I might consider it a mistake. But no, it, it revealed so much in the interviews and it wasn't a mistake. But I, it's very difficult for me to understand how a question can be a mistake.
because a question seeks an answer. Although, in a future episode, I might make a mistake asking a question, but no, not a mistake. And what's it like to just watch a man break down right in front of you? Humbling and how can you be pissed off when someone doesn't reply to an email or someone sends you a voice memo two minutes too long on WhatsApp? How can that bother you when a man in front of you thinks about killing himself every day? Mm -hmm. So how it made me feel was, I wanna go and hug my wife and kids, I wanna be a better person, I wanna stop. I'm not really a whinger and a moaner. I have the occasional rant, I let it out, I crack on. But for every little whinge and moan and rant that was over something small, I almost felt a little bit of shame in the moment of seeing Craig. Because, I'm fucking lucky. And I generally feel lucky and tap into that gratitude. But shame on me if I bitched and whined and moaned or sweat over something so small. How long has it been since you were discharged? Uh, 2013, I got discharged in October. So 10 fucking years yeah. and you're still... Oh, massively. I am... I am so sad. So sad. And I sit in my therapist and he goes, how's your day? How's your week? I goes, I'm just so sad. I don't know why I'm so sad. I just feel shit. I can't control it. I can't control. I can't control not being happy. We don't go out. Me and my wife don't go out. We don't do stuff because I just, I fret all the time. I got a train here, it took a lot of strain to come here. And I'm just tired of being sad, I'm just tired of... Just tired of it, just tired. And I don't know why, I'm, I'm always sad. Yeah, that for me was the hardest part, actually, because he didn't just say that and he didn't just quote that, he cried that out. So... That was the hardest part because the Betsy part about his dog, I'd seen that on Lab Bible, so I knew about that. But this, when he said, I'm just sad every day, it just was an outpouring of real emotion, real emotion. Like, I hope you show the clip. Um, and yeah, that was the hardest, most moving part. <laughs> it doesn't seem fair or right that any human being should feel sad every day. It doesn't. It makes me want to hug him. And it makes me want to help him. Um, yeah, that was the hardest part, I would say. I thought his, um, his story about the death threats he received was harrowing and he literally had to leave the country. And that was a whole mess up by the MOD and, and, and news outlets basically just revealing to terrorist organisations, here he is and here's where he lives. I mean, if that was you, what, what the hell would be going through your mind to, for you as a man to protect your family if you were in that situation? Yeah, so that made me quite angry actually. Um, someone's negligence or someone's desire for a story has put his life in danger. I don't know the context, and I think it's always important to know the context. I don't know how that happened. But, I mean, when he talked about the story that the police had found a car and it had all been stripped out and it had his pictures in it where they were going to kidnap him, and they would have tortured him. Yeah. They wouldn't have just cut off his head on a video or whatever they would do. Because they were the threats he was getting, by the way. They would have tortured him. So, um, yeah. That, that, that made me um, angry and, and sad. Um, and thank goodness it didn't happen. And he also said the Iraq war and Afghanistan war, which is um, the two wars he served in over, I think he served 10 tours within those, within those conflicts, those wars. He said, um, ultimately worthless. Yeah, I asked him, is war necessary? And he said, no. I don't know where I sit on that because clearly Craig feels, and he tells a story that Wars aren't necessarily fought for the reasons that you're told. Well, he said it, didn't he? 
oil, one of them. So you're led to believe something, that you're fighting for something, when in fact lives were lost over greed and money and power. But human greeting, human greetings, <laughs> but human beings seek greed and power. So wars might not be necessary, but wars may always happen. How are we ever going to not have wars? If people have got different values, they're going to fight to defend their values. So that's a difficult one, that one. Something I took away from it, something I just, I didn't understand was about PTSD or chronic PTSD. You hear about it, it's kind of talked about, but it's the first time in my life I've just looked at a man and just seen it right there and mm. the real consequences of it. And I, you know, I think I understand it, even if it's just 1%. Understanding of what Craig goes through every day. What, what did you take away uh, and an understanding from your conversation with Craig? That he's struggling every day and that there must be hundreds of thousands of other men and ex-military men and also women by the way, but um, That are struggling on the same level. How do we help these people? How do we help each other? Like I often think about this. Let's say I'm driving and you, you're a bit impatient and you cut me up. How do I not know that your wife hasn't had a stroke and you're trying to rush her to hospital? Instead, what I'll probably do is go, fuck you, in the protection of my metal cage of a car. Why aren't I more sympathetic to the fact that you might have a really important meeting that you're late for why don't I just let you in? And I don't know what you've been through. So why aren't I just a bit more loving and caring and forgiving? That's one thing that I pondered after meeting Craig. The next thing is some people go around telling you the stats of the chances of being born. And maybe we can put it up on the screen, but it's something like 44 trillion to one or whatever. So there's a 44 trillion to one chance that you and I are sharing this planet. That's pretty fucking cool. You're my brother, not my enemy. Because the odds of us being here together at the same time are so slim, it's a miracle. So why do we see people as enemies? Why aren't we all on the same journey? We're all struggling with the same shit. Life is hard. I think if we really considered the chances of being born, we'd go, whoa, this is cool, man. This is like, dude, I wish we'd do that a bit more. Is it ever right to take someone's life to save another life? Um, who am I to judge? Um, I can give you my opinion, but I'm no judge, I'm no jury. I'm no moral higher or lower than anyone else. So if I was running a country, might I sacrifice a few lives if I knew it would save the many? Yeah, I probably would. If someone was attacking my family and I had a choice between watching them get killed or take them out, would I take them out? Fucking right, I would. So it's not necessarily right to take a life, but sometimes the cost of a life is smaller because you save more lives. But we all have our own threshold of what we would do to take a life. That's an individual thing. Did this podcast affect you on an emotional level more than any other podcast and did you almost cry? Yeah, I, I probably did nearly. You'd have to look at the interview. Um, I definitely felt very emotional. And no, I have never had such an emotional interview. 1,200 episodes, nothing close as moving and emotional. Um, and even the Lab Bible one, I watched this was twice as honest in terms of the emotion and also we just don't tend to edit as much as other shows and we know because we've been interviewed the other side we did one recently yeah. didn't we and we know that'll be heavily edited um, so yeah by far the most emotional episode I've ever listened to or ever been in the same room interviewing as and I must have listened to 
5,000 podcast episodes and we've done 1,200 ourselves. Mm. There's nothing that comes close. There's something I picked upon during the interview and I didn't say anything. And some of the guys in the team, they've watched the interview and they've picked it up as well, that he really has um, a strong bond and just real love for his wife, Tanya. What do you think about their relationship? Yeah, I did feel that. Mm. Like at the end I said, what's the goal for the rest of your life? And he said, I just want to love my wife more. I can't really love my wife anymore. I feel like I love my wife as much as I could love my wife, but I'm going to try. And that made me want to love my wife more and yours and everyone else's <laughs> like that. Just for someone to love someone that much, that is very powerful. It's also very vulnerable because what if she leaves him? And it must be really hard for her. It must be so hard for the wife of someone with chronic PTSD. Well, it was obvious. We actually talked to her afterwards. Um, so that really blew me away, that did. Let's hypothesize something. In another life, you're not an entrepreneur, you're a soldier. What type of soldier would you have been? And if you experienced the things Craig went through, how would that have changed your life? I don't know enough about the military and the ranks to say, you know, I would have liked to have been the general. <laughs> <laughs> of course you would, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what well, entrepreneur wouldn't. I wouldn't want to be the guy with the helmet and the bayonet on the end of my gun, put it that way. Um, but I actually, after meeting Craig, could have seen myself as a sniper. I think that I'm much more in tune with my own company than I used to be. Um, the precision and planning, I actually, I always used to win all the shooting competitions I used to go in, whether it was clay or mm. rifle. Um, and I don't know if I could do close combat and I don't know if I could be really close there with all the, the death. So maybe I would be a sniper. Um, and what was the second part? half of the question. If you had to experience this, well, have the same combat experience and fight wars and take lives uh, and watch your friends die like Craig did, how would that affect your life? Could you be one of these people who just blocks it out and gets on with their life? Or would you be more like Craig, just haunted by it? I don't even know how I would be able to answer that question because how do you know anything unless you've experienced it? Um, well, how do you deal with pain? How do you deal with grief? How do you deal with that? Just I haven't had grief on that level. So it would be completely disrespectful to even try and analogise my pain. You know, being the fattest kid in your year at school for three years versus seeing hundreds of people die, it's not the same level of pain. I'm quite an emotional person, so if I had to put money on the table and make a bet, probably would have fucked me up properly, I would say. I'm quite an emotional person anyway. So, you know, I might have done a lot of personal development, I might be a pretty pro positive guy, I might have run a pretty successful business, I might have a pretty strong mind. But no, I think that would have fucked me up, quite frankly. And finally, how can your conversation with Craig help people? Well, number one, watch the interview and support his charity. Number two, just see life from other people's point of view a bit more and love them a bit more and be a bit more interested in your fellow human. We've got our own pain, we've got our own problems, we've got our own mission, we have to focus on that. But just, if everyone watched that and we were 5% more interested in caring in others, imagine the butterfly effect of good that would ripple out. Be grateful every day. Catch yourself bitching and moaning and slap yourself. Um, and if you get a chance to share it, just share it. I'll be promoting it heavily when it comes out. I've stayed in touch with Craig. I always get very short responses. <laughs> um, and hopefully this will um, have a, a good impact and some people will get helped. <laughs>